What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is Thursday, which means we are doing a mock draft on Underdog Fantasy. Not really a mock draft because it's a $3 draft, which means everybody is taking this very seriously. Let me move my big ass face out of the way. As you could see, I will link the download for the app in the description of this video as well as the pinned comment. Is my mic on? Can y'all hear me? Testing, testing. Oh, oh, we good. Okay. So Underdog Fantasy is a best ball platform, which means the software automatically starts each player for you each week. You pick a big team, 18 players, quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, and tight ends only. No kickers, no defenses. Oh, we missed the draft. Okay, so basically what I do is I post in our Discord channel when I'm about to kick the draft off so y'all can come in and draft with me, okay? If you are interested in doing so, make sure that one, you you download, you, you just follow those instructions right above my head. And then you you, you join our Discord channel through through Patreon. Patreon.com slash BDGE. This is a 12-team league, half PPR. So you pick 18 players, right? You pick a big-ass roster because you don't make any in-season moves. Now, everyone's in the comments section all the time like, why do you want to do best ball? It seems like it's taking the fun out of fantasy. What are you talking about? The fun part about fantasy is doing the drafts. I have the 110 pick. Silverstone, is that you think that's Bobby's Bobby Sylvester? Think that's his fraud account? Think that's a burner? He still wants to get his fantasy action even though no one will have him. Best ball is the best part of fantasy football. Season-long drafts, like all you do is draft. You don't have to worry about waiver wires. You don't have to worry about in-season moves. It automatically starts the best players. You got a big-ass roster. You don't have to make any in-season moves. Come back at the end of the year. Collect your monies. Show me the money, right? That's what I think of when I start playing on underdog fantasy. Okay, we are nine picks. We're at the 110. This is phenomenal. I haven't had a chance to draft Clyde edwards helaire in the first round yet, and this is about where I'd be taking him. I love both Clyde, and I love Josh Jacobs this year. I will not be going with the wide receiver, as you guys know, or as you guys should know at this point. Uh, we are all in on, on double-tapping running backs with our first two picks. And that stays the same for best ball. There is no difference here for me, right? I want the top two guys performing week in and week out. Now, the starting lineups for this particular platform, one quarterback, one uh, two running backs, three wide receivers, one tight end. So it's not super flex. There's no premium scoring or anything. There are three wide receivers that go into your lineup, which means that you probably should be drafting a plethora of wide receivers. So if we go very heavy with the running backs in the beginning, it gives you a little bit of leverage to go with like five running backs on your team and then seven or eight wide receivers to go with that. I would have loved to have grabbed Jacobs there, but we're going to grab one of Nick Chubb or Austin Eckler on the back turn. I might, you know, I might switch things up because I I've been going just running back, running back, and basically every one of my drafts, and I haven't taken any wide receivers. So just to kind of diversify the revenue, Devontae Adams is right up there as my wide receiver one. Ooh, we going with Kittle, huh? So he leaves me Nick Chubb. He leaves me Austin Eckler. And I like both guys. If this was a season-long league, I probably would have smashed either Chubb or Eckler because if you guys have been listening to me, you know that the reason we're going with running back, running back is the... Value of the position is so much more, I can't think of another word, valuable at the running back position compared to wide receivers, compared to tight ends, compared to quarterbacks. The win over replacement level for fantasy, I'm going to show you, I want to bring up a tweet, and this is actually, I think, in the Bible. Uh, let me see if we can get Twitter up here. I forget who tweeted it out, but I'm going to have to pull up something that I think is super, super valuable to y'all. And I want you to listen to this. I want you to see this. Big Dogs Draft Guide dot Kerm. In the Bible, we put a wins. You know what? Long story short, long story short to save you some time. Um, the win over replacement values is how you should be valuing the top positional players in fantasy. And running backs have occupied over the last 10 years, 20 of the top 25 win over replacement value players. Okay. Should tell you all you need to know. Wide receivers don't move the needle. Okay. Quarterbacks very rarely move the needle. I think they were three or four of the top 25. Tight end was one. 
Okay, it was one of Gronk's blow up years. Besides that, it's all running backs. That's all you need to know, which is why I'll be smashing them in the early rounds of all my drafts. This, the scarcity of, of the running backs at the position, workhorse running backs, give you so much of an edge over guys who are taking wide receivers, right? Because the wide receivers tend to average a, a limited amount of points compared to the guys that they are replacing, okay? So if you grab a, wide receiver, a back-end wide receiver one, or you can grab a wide receiver two, two rounds later, they put up points per game basis around the same number of points, okay? I'll just be drilling that into your head for the next month and a half. C-Mac, Saquon, Kamara, Zeke, Dalvin Cook. We talked about this in Fade the Public a little bit, or we will be talking about it in tomorrow's Fade the Public episode. Are we worried about Alvin Kamara and this whole niche fucking spiel that's coming out now? Listen, like, I'm not worried about this because it's not... If he had a torn ACL, he would have been off the field. So what's most likely scenario, and hopefully we'll get more context behind it, is that Kamara maybe had like an MCL sprain or something, okay? And that's something that we've seen with like Joe Mixon. That's something that we've seen with tons of tons of running backs. It happens every year to running backs. And they miss anywhere from like one to three weeks, typically. And then they're back to their normal selves. So you combine the high ankle sprain with an MCL sprain or something, and that is pretty clearly the reason why Kamara dipped off in terms of efficiency last year. Completely fine taking Kamara at the 103. Um, if you want to take Zeke over him, I obviously have no real argument against that because his workload is going to be ridiculous. Dalvin Cook at the one five. I uh, listen in season long. I'm okay with it because you can jump up a couple rounds and grab Alexander Madison. Okay, so so it works out from a team building standpoint. However, why I'm kind of against it in best ball particularly is because. Dalvin Cook is very risky. He's one of the riskier, like top five, top seven picks. And I don't tend to when you're when you're playing with best ball, you're shooting for upside. You want to win the league, right? And you want to do that in all in all league formats, of course. But when you're in a regular season long league, you have the option of hitting the waiver wire. You have the option of making trades. Here, if you're drafting Alexander Madison two rounds above ADP to secure the handcuff, you're playing for safety. We don't play for safety in in best ball. You don't want to occupy two of your five or six running back spots with guys on the same team because that means at any given point, one of them, right? Automatically one of them. If best case scenario, Dalvin Cook hits. That means you're getting pretty much zeros from Alexander Madison on a weekly basis. If Dalvin Cook's risk is baked into it and something does happen where he gets hurt, then it's Alexander Madison's show. But that means Dalvin Cook's giving you a zero. So handcuffs and best ball are a bad idea for that reason because it automatically wipes out one of the two running back spots that you picked and you don't have chances to maneuver around it. So Dalvin Cook season long is fine because you have the replacement. We're up. We took a wide receiver, and this is why we go running backs early because we hate the value at running backs here. Even though I don't hate Melvin Gordon, I love me some Allen Robinson, and we are going to grab him here. Yes, time to not run out. I love some of the comments I get whenever I time out on these picks, and everyone's like, oh, I get anxiety when Nick starts talking and he goes to other pages and shit because he always misses his pick. But we're going to be praying that Melvin Gordon falls back to me at the four here. I don't think it's going to happen. But it could because Cy Yarber has two running backs. Zero wide receivers. Um, oh, this is a cool feature. Yes. So they have the draft board here, which is neat. And I could pop it out to another browser. So I'm going to be looking at the draft board. And I'll show you guys this frequently. But for y'all, uh, we're going to keep it in the... No, are you... Uh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Secondary display. Yes, there we go. I'll be looking at the draft board. Actually, this is kind of more confusing for me. You know what? We're just going to X that out. Pretend like it never happened. I don't know how to do that now. Okay. So Melvin Gordon goes off the board. Very, 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 very unfortunate, which means I'm probably just going to double tap on wide receivers. Jonathan Taylor is a little too early for me in the early fourth round, as I've been explaining to you guys throughout this entire week. Talked about Jonathan Taylor in depth and why he's okay, like fifth round, sixth round pick, but fourth round, early fourth round does not make sense to me when we still have wide receivers so I could stack up Devontae Adams, Allen Robinson, and then my choice of, you know, Odell, Ridley, Woods. We'll see what tight ends are left. I love Mark Andrews, man. I might t tap him here, but it's, I think it makes more sense to double tap two or three high end or high upside tight ends later in the draft, right? Like, I don't know if I want to spend fourth round capital on Mark Andrews now when I can go with like Jared Cook and then TJ Hawkinson in the 10th, 11th round. So I'd rather take the high upside play in Odell. So we've started our team off with Clyde, Devontae Adams, Allen Robinson, Odell Beckham. So 
Like that's a phenomenal start. But still, the reason we want to go with running backs early is because you know who do we end up getting as our running backs two, our running backs three, our running backs four? Team looks a lot less flexy sexy when we don't hit them running backs early. So what I could have done is had Clyde and Austin Eckler or Clyde and Nick Chubb. And then my team would be looking like Clyde and, and Eckler and then Allen Robinson, Odell. And I think that's a nice pairing there, regardless of not having the Devontae Adams at the top. Okay, so let's see what kind of other picks we've got made. Wow, Terry is shooting up draft boards. Terry before Robert Woods, before Calvin Ridley. This seems like this is just like the dead zone for me, man. This is why you need to get the running backs early because like mid third round. I don't want James Conner. I don't want Todd Gurley. I don't want David Johnson. I don't want David Montgomery that early. It gets messy, y'all. It gets messy. JT at the 410. Yeah, so going back to Kamara from the beginning, early, early round pick for me still. The, that news does not scare me. Miles Sanders, Deuce Staley came out, said he's ready to handle the full workload. You love to hear it as a Miles Sanders guy. Yesterday, Miles Sanders came out and almost fucking gave me a heart attack tweeted out he had like a subtle tweet that was like i can't catch a break and immediately obviously my worst case scenario I, I tweeted out like 17 quote tweets of memeing him being like you broke my fucking heart my life is over and then the next tweet like two minutes later i guess he probably got 75 people tweeting at him that they just like ruined his fantasy season he was like y'all i'm good I'm, I'm gonna be good for the season so something personal going on there best of luck to you miles love you dog D Swift at the five two, man. Like, look at this. Look at this fourth and early fifth round, just orgy of wide receivers: McLaurin, Woods, Ridley, DJ Chark, Sutton, Lockett, Metcalf. Like, how can you even think about taking a running back in that zone? Makes me sick, sick to my, sick to my guts. Mark Ingram, you know someone. Someone asked me this the other day because I had David Montgomery listed in my must own running back video in like the fifth round. And they're like, okay, you're buying into David Montgomery as a floor play, but you're going to be fading Mark Ingram. I don't necessarily know what kind of floor we're getting from Mark Ingram. Guys, last year he got 200 carries. Like David Montgomery got almost 40 more carries than Ingram did. And now they're adding a stud in JK. Wow, 5'8 on JK Dobbins. Ooh, people are people are getting feisty here with these rookie running backs. Um, Man, this is where I would smash Devontae Parker, too. Ugh, I, sh I should have just went with two running backs. I should have stuck on my gut and stopped getting fucking cute over here. I have no Zach Ertz either, and I feel like that's probably a mistake, but that's because I love Waller there, so fuck Zach Ertz still. I have no Raheem Mostert. I think at this point I would take Ronald I'm taking Ronald Jones in the fifth, yeah. We're getting dicey here. Fuck it. Fuck it. We're all in. I've been riding this train for a couple months now, and I will continue, too, as we continue to hear more and more positive reports come out. Bruce Arians continually comes out and just saying he's going to be the guy. He's going to be the one that handles the workload in this bike field. And people are like, oh, he's lying about that because he always lies. Not really. Like when you go back, he was like, Chris Johnson is the guy. Chris Johnson got like 20 carries a game until he got hurt. Oh, Andre Ellington was the guy. Andre Ellington started the year as a featured fucking back there until he got hurt. So without injury, the guys that he says are going to be the guys are the guys. We saw it last year with Chris Godwin, right? I've explained this before. He came out and said a lot of things about Chris Godwin. All came to fruition. He talked shit about Jameis Winston. He gone. Like, Bruce Arians is not mince words here, man. Yes, some outside circumstances might change and dictate what happens, and, and coaches can change their mind if a player gets hurt and then they come back, but the guy who filled in for him played phenomenally. Of course, you're not just going to shove someone back into that role. But from what we're hearing out of Tampa Bay, like, Ronald Jones is going to get a monster workload. So I don't hate him as the RB2. And again, like this is best ball. So you're going to draft five or six running backs and they're going to start the best running backs each week for you. So I can, I, you know, I could pair up. There's a few guys I don't necessarily love. Like I don't think I own any Raheem Mostert. So if he falls to me here, I might take him, honestly. I think I'm going to do that because I always preach diversifying the revenue. What If I'm wrong about Mostert, if I'm wrong about him and he pops off for 1,300 rushing yards this year, I'm going to look like a fool, and that's going to hurt a lot of my best ball teams. So we're going to go with Mostert there, and I'm, I'm liking the start to this team right here. Clyde, RJ, Mostert, Devontae Adams, Robinson, Beckham. See, this is this is a good team, I think, to draft a guy like Mostert with because you're not necessarily depending on him to be the guy, and you have such a solid team around him. 
Like if you're starting to reach into the late fourth, the early fifth round, and you're depending on him to be, you know, maybe your RB1, maybe your faded running backs, maybe your RB2. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, I, I think that like you need to make sure that when you're drafting a risky guy like Moser in the fifth, sixth round, which are still like really big pieces of your team. You know, we talk about drafting high upside players later. And I think that's probably the case. For, I, th- I think basically once you get to like round seven, that's when you want to start to kind of shoot for the stars there, right? Because, you know, we're always like, you now after round four, we want to start shooting for upside. But like round five and six are still like very much key core pieces of your pl- uh, of your team that you're going to need to be producing week in and week out. I don't know if any of that makes sense. I feel like I probably just contradicted myself 32 different times. Uh, if I make no fucking sense, you should hit the thumbs up button. The more thumbs up buttons I get, the less sense I made, which means I'll make sense next time. Okay. That's how you let me know whether or not I'm making any sense. Okay. So we're seeing a little tight end run. We're seeing the quarterback run. Yep. And I've been preaching this. I, I am fully on board with getting one of the tier two quarterbacks in round six and round seven. I don't think Russ is going to fall to me all the way back here. So I probably have missed out on that. And for that reason, I will stay away from quarterbacks until later on in the draft and probably double. I'll probably triple tap on both quarterbacks and tight ends. What happens is you start to build your team and you get all these skill players and then you don't know whether or not you want to go with three quarterbacks and three tight ends or two quarterbacks and three tight ends and vice versa. And it puts you in a little bit of a pickle. Puts you in a little bit of a pickle. Tevin Coleman at the 612, huh? So funny to see how like draft movements change. When I started playing underdog like a month ago, you can get Tevin Coleman in the 10th round. And now... That is not the case. I hope I can get t- Tyler Boyd here. Put Boyd there. AJ Green is another guy that I just have no. Okay. Okay, Daniel. Okay, fucking Daniel. Ruin my f- ruin my Wednesday fucking morning. Whatever. We're going to fight through the pain. You guys think I should take Darius Geis here? I'm not going to do it. Not going to do it. All right, fine. I'm going to do it. Put him in the queue. Put him in the bucket. Just kidding. Calm the fuck down. Calm it down, everybody. Take it down and nurch. Jalen Rager in the 7-8. Nope. We ain't going to do that. Rookie wide receivers. Which rookie wide receivers do we think can produce this year? I think Rager can produce for sure. Seventh round is fucking early when you still have guys like Marvin Jones, Deontay Johnson. I really wanted to go with Christian Kirk there. I like Henry Ruggs is probably my favorite running back or my favorite rookie wide receiver to produce let's see what we have at the tight end position yeah this whole tier dropped off for me there so i'm not looking there uh deshaun watson went so i'm also not looking there so we're gonna go back to the skill players i actually really am starting to like james white obviously you know i talked about how i liked sony for the last month or so and now with them signing lamar miller it gets it gets very dicey back there all right so listen i need to be able to pivot all the reports are that he was out of the walking boot he was fully into rehab and he was looking good and now it's like we we're unsure about week one. If we're this, if we're a month out from week one and we have no idea whether or not he's going to be on the field, that's worst case scenario. Like if you're a month away and you're not getting reports that like you're close to 100%. Because when players say, players and coaches come out and they say, oh, uh, he's close to 100%. He's not fucking close to 100%. He's like a week or two away probably from 100%. So when they're telling you right now, they don't know if a player is going to be good for week one, you got a problem. You got a really big problem. They're probably going into the year Less than 100%. And as I always say, do not find injuries in fantasy football, especially not the draft, because they will find you. Okay? There's one thing to take away from all of my fucking analysis this summer. It's that injury optimism is so real. It's the realest thing in fantasy football. Anytime you find yourself being like, oh, if he's if he stays healthy, oh, I heard he's going to be healthy for the start of the season – Slap yourself right across your face and say, wait, is this injury optimism? And then fade whatever the fuck you just said. Okay. That is how you play ball. Woo. Uh, Henry Ruggs. I'm, I'll take some Deontay Johnson. He keeps dropping into the eighth round and I'm okay with that. I really think Deontay Johnson's got some Antonio Brown vibes to him, man. He is nasty against press coverage and man coverage, uh, separating against cornerbacks, man. And he led the team in a lot of receiving statistical categories last year, despite playing with all these shitty quarterbacks, man. So I think Deontay Johnson has a real, real, real good chances of emerging as the outside alpha in this Pittsburgh offense. 
And um, I'll take eighth round Deontay Johnson. Anything earlier is way too much for me, though. So now we have four running backs. We have four wide receivers. And yeah, going back to the Sony Michelle thing, terrified of the uh, injury optimism. Do we want to grab Damian Harris? I mean, listen, the guy had fucking four carries last year. I actually, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to spit out some big facts for y'all. So I went on to Rotoviz's game screener or Rotoviz's player screener. And this is a way to download like all of the, the stats from the last 20 years, right? And you can kind of push your narrative. So I wanted to look at running backs because Damian Harris had literally four carries last year. I wanted to look at running backs who had fewer than 10 carries in their rookie season and who, if any of them, did well the next year, okay? So obviously a couple did well. So I exported over the last 20 years, dating back to the year 2000, any running back who had fewer, who had 10 or fewer carries in his rookie season, okay? That came out to 220 running backs. Of the 220 running backs, the following year, five of them, five of 220, which comes out to 1.8%, 1.8% of them averaged 10 half PPR fantasy points per game or more. 1.8. Okay? So, if we're drafting Damian Harris, Damian, Damian Harris, that's his new name, D. Harris. If we're drafting Damian Harris, understand that his chance of being, and, and, and 10 fantasy points per game is not, that's like a flex play, right? That's not even an exciting thing. That's not like real, like legit mid RB2 numbers. A 1.8% chance of hitting flex numbers for you are outrageous. And I want to expand it. Like, okay, how many of those saw five half PPR fantasy points per game or more? And it came out to, I think it was like 18 of 220. So that was like 7% or 8% hit rate on that. And if you're drafting a guy with the hopes of him having five half PPR fantasy points per game, shut your laptop down, close YouTube out, don't watch me again, because you don't know what the fuck you're doing, okay? So Damian Harris has always been a fucking LSD infused fucking dream of yours. That being said, I'm probably going to be really fucking wrong about him. RB1 Damian Harris is here. Draft him up, scoop him up wherever you can. No, but that's why I'm going with James White, because we know James White's role in this offense. It doesn't matter who's coming in as the, as the head running back. It doesn't matter if Damian Harris... If Dam- why do I keep calling him fucking Harris? Turn your brain on, Nicholas. Turn your brain on. The people are here for the big facts, not the farce facts. So yeah, I got to pump myself up, because no one else is going to do it. So what happens when you fucking talk into a microphone to nobody for a living? It stinks. It ain't all it's cracked up to be. Being a podcaster, not easy work. Woof! Okay. We are bike. It's probably time to start dipping into other positions. Remember when I said we can smack back to bike tight ends here? Because they go late as shit. That's what we gonna do. Do we love any of the running backs left? Damn. It's too much value to pass on guys here, man. It's too much value. Gotta do it. I'm kidding. Fucking relax, guys. Love me some Deshaun Jackson. I think I'm getting higher. Oh, we got to talk about rookie wide receivers because there are a few that are starting to rise up my draft board quickly. Did I take Henry Ruggs? No, I didn't. Oh, boy. What am I doing? Uh, Jared Cook is my fucking guy this year. He's my tight end seven, guys. He is my tight end seven this year. He's my tight end seven. I've never felt more confident in a late round tight end to have a very, very good season than I do in Jared Cook. Don't ask me why. If you want to know why, just read, the, just go into the Big Dogs Draft Guide. Honestly, all my rankings are in here. So if you're wondering where my uh, my rankings are, they're on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Go to the season long drop down and then season long rankings, and it'll all be in there. The cheapest way to get the draft guide though is through Monkey Knife Fight. They have sponsoring the draft guide, so you can literally get everything on that website: the dynasty drop down, the season long drop down, the tools, Doctor Morse's full breakdowns of injuries and shit. MonkeyKnifeFight.com. Deposit $10 on their website and use the promo code BDGE. It's very fucking important that you use the promo code BDGE, guys. You can't be emailing me afterwards like, I didn't use the promo code. Where's my draft guide? You need to use the promo code to get the draft guide. You need to. You need to do it. You play a game on there and I'll email you access if you want to get all my rankings for your seasonal drafts. All right. So we had three old shitty wide receivers rip off the board in between my Jared Cook. And this is when I double bike down. And do exactly what I said I was going to do. Round 9, round 10, Jared Cook, TJ Hawkinson. Do I take a quarterback? Actually, I might double down and take... You. I love to stack. I love to stack in best ball. 
damn, I should have went with Drew Brees. No, because then I wouldn't have Jared Cook. Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers make sense. I'm going to go with Drew Brees. I'm starting to think that Drew Brees was, was severely underrated last year. He was really good on a points-per-game basis before he got hurt and after he got hurt. And uh, maybe his demise has been exaggerated. So if there's one tip to take away with best ball, it is to make sure that you are stacking, okay? Make sure that you are stacking your quarterbacks with some kind of pass catcher. So we have Drew Brees stacked Jared Cook. And if I can, I will try to grab Aaron Rodgers and stack him with Devontae Adams. See how long he lasts. And things will be good. Things will be good in the headquarters if we can do that. So rookie wide receivers. Love that pick with Brandon Ayuk. So Debo Samuel, another injury optimism guy. The problem with Debo Samuel is we have this timeline of like 10 to 12 weeks, which puts him at like right at the beginning. But that's just a timeline of when we're hoping it to be healed by. If it's another week, that goes into the season. He gives himself a greater chance of pushing himself to get onto the field and re-injuring it, okay? That's way more likely to happen with a guy who's not going into the year 100%, which means Brandon Ayuk will operate as the alpha on the outside. George Kittle, too, has a very high injury risk with the separated shoulder that he did not get surgery on last year. 50% re-dislocation rate for people who dislocated their shoulder in the previous year and did not get off-season surgery. Okay, George Kittle did not get off-season surgery. Him and Debo, both very high injury risks, which mean Brandon Ayuk. Phenomenal season-long pick. Phenomenal best ball pick. He's going to have his games. He's going to be a playmaker. Kyle Shanahan loves them yak. Them yak dogs. Loves yak like I love caffeine. Can't get enough of that shit. Sonny Michelle, see, can't do it right now. You just can't do it at the 10th. All right, so we got, uh, did we have any of the quarterbacks go off the board? No, I might, get, I might be able to snag Aaron Rodgers and, and double tap. This is, why, yeah, this is why I really like just going with straight skill position players for like the first, literally I did it for the first eight rounds because there are always good options that you could just continue to slam at the end of the drafts. Triple down on tight ends if you want. Triple down on quarterbacks. Anything interesting here? Yes. Yeah, I want to see. Was Brent the one that took Dalvin Cook? 10-9? No, it was scurvy. Okay. See, like, <sighs> Madison's not a guy. I would say in best ball, if you're going to do handcuffs, then taking someone else's handcuff is the way to go. Don't be handcuffing your own guys. What are the running backs do we like here? I have no shares of Darrell Henderson. Uh... I didn't watch Hard Knocks last night, actually, or two nights. Uh, you guys are watching this Thursday, so I haven't watched it yet. By the time you actually watch this, I might have seen it. I did hear Darrell Henderson took first team reps, but like, okay, get the fuck over yourselves, guy. It's not like Cam Akers was going to enter the year as a featured back, but I think it does say that Henderson's going to have some sort of role in this offense and possibly a big one. So Darrell Henderson's a guy I probably need to get more shares of. DeAndre Washington is a guy I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a lot of shares of, too. Except not in this draft, because I have Clyde Edwards Hilaire. And that would go against everything that I'm saying. What other running backs do we like here? Uh, McKinnon. You guys know I like Anthony McFarlane. One way or another. One way or another, Todd Gurley's not going to be the guy in Atlanta. So I've been scooping a little bit of Brian Hill action. A lot of good wide receivers still left, though. Lazard. One of my favorite stacks. I tweeted this out the other day. Wow, we just had the huge tight end run. I got or did I get two tight ends already? No, I didn't. I went with one. God damn. Okay, so I still like like Jonas Smith here uh, as a high upside tight end, and I'm probably going to take that because all the guys after me only have one. So one of them is going to take him. I don't know. Does Rodgers get back to me? This guy's got zero quarterback, so maybe not. Do I, would I rather have Jonas Smith? I'm going to go with Rodgers here. Make sure I get that stizzy stick. So Breeze, Rodgers, that'll probably occupy my quarterbacks. I don't think I need to take another one. And then I'm hoping that, you know why? Because I still, I, like Austin Hooper would be fine as my tight end too. Jonah Smith is fine as my tight end too. Dallas Goddard's even okay. He finished as a top 10 tight end last year. Been finding myself getting a lot of Adrian Peterson shares as well. God, it, it sucks that you got to start taking Adrian Peterson. 
But we know he's going to get like 15 carries a game. They're going to be shitty, non-valuable carries, but it's going to happen. It gives you a floor player running back. Um, My favorite stack has been like the 12, 13 rounds of best ball, smashing Alan Lazard and Michael Pittman. Like this, the T.Y. Hilton injury optimism is going to be fucking way. He's already dealing with the hamstring injuries. Like get him the fuck off my board. You know what? This See, this is the beautiful stack right here. This is how you win best ball leagues. You stack Aaron Rodgers, who everyone is fading, with his top two receiving options and arguably the only two receiving options on the outside here. And when he throws for 4,530 touchdowns and surprises everybody because he's pissed off, Lazard and Adams are going to ball out and I'm going to win this league. Strictly based on those stacks right there. I love that that just happened. I fucking love it. But I'm getting a lot of Michael Pittman too. So rookie wide receivers for the 17th time, I'm actually going to dive into him this time. Michael Pittman is an alpha on the outside. Built for it, produced like it, and is going to be it. Indy took a lot of draft capital, invested into him over Jonathan Taylor. Very early in the second round, Michael Pittman was their guy. Michael Pittman by next year is going to be the wide receiver one in that offense. I would not be surprised if Michael Pittman led a lot of rookie statistical categories this year. Wouldn't be surprised if he throws up a 50 for 850 and, and seven touchdowns this year. I really wouldn't be surprised. So Michael Pittman's a guy I think can give you redraft value. Rager is a guy that definitely can, but I feel a lot less confident in. I think Deshaun Jackson, I, I think Deshaun Jackson is going to stay on the field. And I think he's going to be the number one target for at least the first half of the season for Carson Wentz. So Rager makes sense. Michael Pittman makes sense. Obviously, I talked about Brandon Ayuk makes a lot of sense given the injury concerns in that San Francisco offense with George Kittle's shoulder, with Debo's foot. Ayuk makes a lot of sense. And there was a report that came out, I think, uh, was it this morning or yesterday? Let's see. I hate that I have to keep moving this shit. Um, about Brandon Ayuk. Where are you? There you go. The Athletics, Matt Barrows expects number 25 overall pick, Brandon Ayuk, to be the 49ers' best outside the hashes target. Connecting dots, Barrows expects Ayuk to essentially take over for Emmanuel Sanders. Like most of the 49ers pass catchers, Ayuk is a yak threat, but he also has the speed and catch radius to do damage on the outside. He was excellent on go routes in the Pac-12. 49ers passing game distribution is a bit of a black box in the COVID year, but Ayuk is well worth late round flyers in 12 team leagues. Agreed. Um... So yeah, Ayuk is a good wide receiver as a rookie that I think can produce right off the rip. Michael Pittman is a favorite of mine. Uh, I like LaVisca Chenault too, just for the fact that like where the fuck else are targets going to go in that offense besides DJ Chark? And there's going to be a lot of them. Like maybe you don't like Minshew. Maybe you don't like this passing offense overall, but the volume is going to be there. And LaVisca Chenault is another like yak monster where just give him the volume and he's going to make enough plays to be valuable for your lineup. I'm not really a fan of T. Higgins. I like Brian Edwards for sure. He was a guy that I, I, I scooped up in a lot of my dynasty leagues, a lot of my rookie drafts because he kept falling to the third round for some fucking absurd reason. Um, but I don't I don't know how much I love him for, for redraft right now. Preston Williams is another guy that we're, we're hearing a lot of like not good reports about him, about we're very questionable about his week one status. Usually by this point, for a guy that's getting hyped up about injuries, you're like, oh, he's going to be fully ready to go. He's going to be this. This is where the frauds come out. Because everyone for five fucking months are like, yep, he's going to be 100% ready to go when training camp comes around. This fake injury optimism from coaches. And then when training camp comes around, you can't lie about them being ready for training camp. You're either fucking on the field or you're not. So when you're not on the field, then you have to start lying about being ready for week one. Because you lie to get there and then you have to lie to get to the next spot. Okay? So, I hate it. Which means Mike Kosicki might be a guy that I have to start buying into. I don't like him as a player. He makes no fucking plays with the ball in his hands. But if he's going to get the volume, he could be a Zach Ertz light. He could be a Hunter Henry light where you catch the ball and fall. But if you're going to get 120 targets, like you, you just can't possibly fade him. Okay. So do I, do I go nuts here and go with the fucking Jay Sternberger ultra green Bay burger stack? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to fucking throw a burger on a burger. Ain't going to finna do it. Uh, Jarwin, Ian Thomas, Chris Herndon would be my top three targets. I like Herndon, man. If you liked him going into last year, there's no reason not to because he got hurt and fucked his entire season. Uh, so I'm actually going to go with Herndon here as my second tight end. I didn't even look at the bye weeks, but it worked out where 
him and Jared Cook are not in the same bye week together. So we've got our second tight end, and now we'll start looking back at the position players. I might grab a third tight end, but it'll be later in the draft. I'll be targeting. I can't believe Dawson Knox is still is going after fucking Greg Olson, Gerald Everett, OJ Howard. Like, it's ridiculous. Dawson Knox had a very good rookie year by all accounts. Super athletic, super raw, but we saw his playmaking ability, and we're going to see a few of those plays this year. Ridiculous. Grow up. Grow up. Okay. Who else we like? I have no shares of Brashad Perriman. There's a very good chance that he is actually the wide receiver one this year in New York and commands wide receiver one targets. So that's not a guy I hate. I like John Ross a little bit too. Who else we like here? It doesn't really matter because we have five really solid wide receivers. I probably need to be looking more at the running backs, I guess. Damn, I might take DeAndre Washington here just because just because he's he's a good value here, man. Like I hate double stacking Clyde and DeAndre Washington, but like in any normal draft, I'd be taking DeAndre Washington in the 14th round. So I, I will go against my better judgment here. Should I take Jarek McKinnon? Should I do it? Should I done do it? I'm going to take DeAndre. Listen, I, I don't keep it 100. I keep it 99 because I'm because I lie a lot. I try my best. What else we got? There we go. See? See? We were fucking doing Fade the Public the other day. Honestly, make sure you're following Scott because he's always editing up like fantastic clips like this. Where's the volume? It is. It's impossible. Season for fantasy It's impossible. Stats because I everyone was... I, I had a good that's article. Why, that's why... That's We've bit, talked yeah. about it. It's so hard to put context behind the Giants. It is. It's impossible. Season for fantasy. It's impossible stats because I everyone was. I, I had a good that's article. Why, that's I can't why find I sit it. There. It's a carousel of fantasy. There was a guy that did a, a, a good breakdown of like all the targets and how they were distributed based on when like Darius Slayton, Golden Tate, and oh, Shepard kn- played together. Then I know, when Shepard and off the field. Like, I know who. I know who did that. Slayton's uh, like me, stayed the same. Motherfucker. Was it? I did that. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. We've talked about it. It's so hard. Unbelievable animal. So the Giants wide receiver core. Animals out here like, oh, there's a great piece of content, giving context behind it. I'm like, bitch, like I worked hard to put that content out. Put some respect to my fucking name. Sorry, I'm not gonna curse again for the entirety of the rest of the draft. Promise. If I don't if I don't curse for the rest of the draft, all of you have to buy the draft guide on monkeyknifefight.com. Monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10 bucks, you'll get an email from me with draft guide access within 24 hours. And make sure you download the Underdog Fantasy app, please. This is like the funnest place to practice for your actual drafts because they're mock drafts, but they're all money drafts, okay? Like you got to throw at least a dollar to get into these drafts, which means everyone's taking it seriously. So you're getting a realistic view, right? You can do draft wizards on Fantasy Pros. You could look at ADP on like Fantasy Football Calculator, but most of it is nonsense. Most of it is just like fake mock drafts. Most of it is is data pulled from drafts that are not relevant to what's going to be happening in the real world. This is real. Money's real. Money talks. I'll tell you what, it's really hard for me not to curse. That's probably a life problem that I need to start focusing on a little bit more. Where are we at right now in the drafts? My guy Derek Carr just went off, but we're not going to take another quarterback here. We are going to continue to focus on probably tight end, wide receiver, and running back. And I have two guys in my queue, Jarek McKinnon and Brian Hill, who I could probably wait on. I'll, I'll take McKinnon if he falls to me here at the end of the 15th. And Brian Hill is usually a last round guy. He's pretty far down the list. I'm, I think I'm literally the only... If Underdog could export every draft that they've had so far, I might be the only person that's ever taken Brian Hill. Y'all going to come back. Y'all going to come back next year and be like, oh my God, how did you know Todd Gurley wasn't going to be good in fantasy? And I'm going to just put up all the clips of me. It's just going to be a, a montage of clicks. It's going to be every time that I clicked on Brian Hill to draft him in here. Brian Hill going to be that dude in Atlanta. Just wait on it. Just wait on it. You heard it here. First, last, second, 14th, and 72nd. All right here. Son, I need you to come out. You know what I love about my location in Manhattan? There's a park right near me. There's a park right near me. And uh, it's turfed up field, so I like to go there and work out. And the best part about it... Let me see what wide receivers... Yeah, we're going to fade the wide receivers for right now. I'll grab McKinnon here. And the best part about it is... When I go there, 
you get two birds with one stone. I could work out, but I could take my shirt off and get a tan while I'm working out when it's sunny out. And, and this does not count as my curse word because I'm acknowledging it, right? It's not just slipping out of my mouth. I'm prefacing with, I know that I'm about to use a, a bad word. Children, close your ears. And there's always like five or six people there that are being way more douchey than me with their shirts off and like have parachutes attached to their backs and have like full workout things, right? I'm just going there doing pushups and stuff, trying to get a tan. So I would never normally do that at a park when no one else is doing it, but there's always people that look way cornier than me, way worse than I do. So I don't feel bad about taking my shirt off. So I get to tan, I get to work out, I get to come bike here and I feel good about life. And I get to do some more underdog fantasy drafts with y'all. As long as you sign up, after you deposit on underdog to, to draft with me, there's going to be a little page that pops up to do a referral code. Okay. So it's, when it says like partner code, just throw big BDGE in there and it lets them know that I sent you and I'll continue to do these videos for you. You love to hear it. You guys don't love to hear that at all. What are the tight ends? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. We're doing the ultimate green Bay stike. I can't wait for Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon to combine for 700 carries and Aaron Rodgers to throw the ball 212 times. And this team is absolutely shite not a curse word shite's not even in the english dictionary skirt fate fell short this time smile fades in the summer okay yeah i wonder if youtube will pick up on that i wonder if youtube will hear me singing blink 182 and be like nick your voice is so beautiful we thought it was blink 182 and then copyright it delete this video off YouTube. That might be a good thing. So no one can ever see this green Bay stack that I just put together. I'd like to wipe this draft out of existence. Listen, if you sign up and play with me, it's basically free money. If you're in a draft with me, because this is what I do. All right. All right. Late round picks. Love Irv Smith. If I wasn't being annoying and trying to do this green Bay stack, I would have taken Irv Smith there because they have no one to throw the ball to in Minnesota outside of 192 target Adam Thielen. Lynn Bowden. No, absolutely not. Jamal Williams. I don't know what to do with Jamal Williams. Like he he's been a good best ball pick for like the last two years because he has a floor in that offense. Like he's gonna get forty five percent of the snaps. So now with AJ Dillon coming in, I don't know what Jamal Williams is gonna be. So I'm staying away from him. Lamar Miller. Uh yeah, that's that just seemed like a depth pick. I pick up from from the Patriots. There's no way that he's gonna be like part of their game plan. I have very little faith in Lamar Miller doing anything, so I'd rather not take zeros. I'd rather take guys like Larry Fitzgerald who have pretty much no ceiling, but like if three of your wide receivers are on a buy and you need like seven points with a 22% chance of scoring a touchdown. So Larry Fitzgerald gives you at least as opposed to giving you a zero in that spot when you need them. So right now we have two quarterbacks, six running backs, five wide receivers and three tight ends. So I'll probably rip off the rest of the draft with, Maybe, I, I think I'm going to go with a running back heavy approach here just because we went wide receiver early and like I know I'm going to get production out of these five guys or the six guy too, whoever I'm going to take here. And the, the pod father really talked me into grabbing Muhammad Sanu and I hate everything about it. But just like he's almost like a fucking rich man's. Uh, I did it. I cursed. I cursed. Fuck. Since I already did it, it's out of the cat's out of the bag. Uh, it's really hard. I might need to go to an AA meeting. Hi, my name's Nick. And I'm addicted to saying the word cunt. Yikes. You know what? I was at the dinner with a friend last night. And she was talking about how she like kind of wanted to start a podcast. But she's nervous that if she like shares real things that happen in her life, like people are not going to want to work with her. The way I've always approached that is if, you know, if a partner comes on, a possible future potential partner, company, brand, whatever, comes onto my channel and they hear something out of my mouth that they don't like, they're like, we don't want to work with you because you say fuck or cunt or whatever. I'm just like, that's fine because we were not going to be a partnership anyways. If that's what turns you off from me, then we were never going to work anyways, right? Uh, let me make my pick real quick and then I'll get back into the feels. Someone took my man, Brian Hill, or did I take Brian Hill? Ah, so the MacBook's got me freaked up. Yeah, we're going to go with Muhammad Sanu if I can get to him before the timer goes. Skirt. Um, 
so yeah, that's the way I approach business, man. I'll always just be myself completely. And if you have a problem with it, then you're not, then you're not going to like my content. There's no way you could ever make content that appeals to the masses. It'll never happen because I'd rather be relatable to the people that I want in my audience than try to fit in. There are a lot of dudes, like a lot of you guys probably can't even listen to this video or this podcast because you're listening with kids. You're commuting in the car and I curse way too much and I'll get comments like that. I'm like, I do apologize, but that's also who I am. That's also the content that I put out. So if that means you can't watch or can't listen to it, like I'm fine with that. That's not, you know, that's, that's what helps me build the foundation though. That's what helps me build a strong foundation and a loyalty. Trying to please everybody will only keep you in the middle of the spectrum forever. But when you can go really deep with the select few people in your audience, like you build a brand that's super, super strong and they've got your fucking bike all the time. Uh, we are going to go with shit. I should have looked at this stuff before I, uh, uh Edo. Because never Todd Gurley. I don't care. Give me all the pieces of the Atlanta backfield. Give me all of them. Every single one except for Todd Gurley in the third round. Um, yeah, so that's that's going to wrap up my 18th round pick. Let's look at the rest of the draft. Let me move my face out of here. Uh, I'm going to X this out. But guys, again, the links for downloading Google iOS will be in the description. Make sure once you deposit your money, whether it's 10, 20, 50, 100, run it, bike. Shout out to Nipsey Hustle, Rest in peace. Make sure that you throw in BDGE on the partner code on the page after you deposit. So you're going to deposit. But then once they're like successful deposit, did you get referred by a partner or some shit? That's when you put in BDG in the partner code. Let's look at the draft board. Let's look at my team first. Quarterbacks, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers. I did a good job by not selecting two guys on the same buy. Running backs, we stacked up because we went heavy on wide receivers in the earlier rounds. So we got Clyde. Ronald Jones, Raheem Osterp, James White, DeAndre Washington, Jarek McKinnon, Edo Smith. Wide receivers, the cream of the crop here. Devontae Adams, Allen Robinson, Odell Beckham, Deontay Johnson, Alan Lazard, Muhammad Sanu. Tight ends, Jared Cook, Chris Herndon, Jay Sternberger. And we'll get the whole draft board up here so that you guys could see this. Uh, if you want to take like a screenshot of this, by all means, I'll leave this up for like another 10 seconds. So you want to screenshot rounds one through eight here. Scroll down to rounds 9 through 16, and then no one gives a shite about 17 or 18. I don't know if I feel good about this video. I'm going to be honest. Sometimes I get done with the mock drafts, and I'm like, wow, that was really good. Like, I even blew myself away. I black out, and I come come bike, and I'm like, that was so many. That was a ridiculous number of good facts that I just spit out for you guys. Um, I don't know how I feel about this one. I'm going to be honest. Let me know how you guys felt about the video. Not the team. Not the team. I know my team stinks. My team always stinks. Every team I have draft stinks every time. I'm not worried about the team. I'm worried about the content. I want to make sure I'm providing you guys value. So the way to do that by letting me know that it was good is, is hitting the thumbs up button down below. Subscribing to the channel if you are new. We're doing fantasy football content six days a week. Again, if you want to draft with me, download Underdog. Sign up for our Patreon. Patreon.com slash BDGE, which will allow you access into our discord channel which is on and popping all the time we got drafts starting up all the time we got people talking about their teams trades etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a really it's a really really good community that we've built in there and uh make sure you cop the draft guide even though i curse i'm sorry there's a lot of cursing in the draft guide too so if, you, if you're going to be reading it in front of your kids you know what don't buy the draft guide it's not for you but it's for everyone who wants to win their 2020 fantasy football season Season. So monkeyknifefight.com, promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10 bucks on there, play a game, and I'll email you access to the draft guide within 24 hours. 24, 24, 24. I'm so f annoying. I'm sorry. I love you. Bye.